get a load of this, folks. In 30 seconds of the Bob Clampett cartoon, there are more ideas, original drawings, sound ideas, than in 20 of anybody else's cartoons. They're amazing. He was uh, the man who put the word loony in Looney Tunes, in my opinion. He had so much to do with setting the style that we recognize today as the unique Warner style of cartooning. You're an observer, and the cartoon's on the screen, and there's this space between them. And you sit back, and you watch it, and you laugh at the jokes and whatever. Clampett's cartoons would grab me and yank me into the, into the story with them. You couldn't mistake a Clampett cartoon for anyone else's. My father was recognized as having extraordinary talent from a very young age. When I've seen drawings that he had done at the ages of four and five, they were just unbelievable. So he had recognized and known from the earliest days that he wanted to do art, but he especially loved cartooning. And at that point, of course, he was more familiar with comic strips. Through the LA Times, they had awarded him a contract that when he was done with school, he was gonna come be a comic strip artist there. But when he saw animation for the first time, he knew that's where his love was gonna be. He was so drawn to the art of animation that he had to go to Hearst and negotiate out of his contract. He actually started at Warner Brothers when he was only 17 years old. I believe he started with the very first Merry Melodies, not the first Looney Tunes, and he worked his way up as an animator through the 30s. Everything I know about Dad was that he was a very confident young man, and he was a risk taker. He really liked to experiment, and he had a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm. Being at Warner Brothers just created an opportunity for him because there was a freedom there that there weren't at other places, that he could try different things, and he was able to talk management into letting him attend story meetings, and he always had gag ideas and things that weren't even a cartoon he was necessarily working on. When uh, Tex Avery joined the studio around 1936, I believe Chuck and Bob joined Avery's unit, and that was obviously a completely crazy unit. That was the unit known as Termite Terrace, and they really all together created the language of what was going to be become the Warner Brothers cartoon, the crazy, zany, anti-Disney cartoon that they were, they were perfecting. He found an enormous inspiration in Tex. Tex was so irreverent and so willing to be wild and push things to the edge. And that was just the perfect influence for Dad. I think that was where he really felt like, you know what, I don't have to hold back. Any, any idea that I have can make a good cartoon. He admired what Tex Avery was, had, had done and was doing. And so, oh, Bob, he wanted to assume Tex's mantle of quality of inventiveness and everything about animation. Bob was a pretty uh, zany guy, you know, you, you, you know, wonder, wonderful gag man, and, and uh, there was always something different going on, you know. And you know, there's fun to be around, fun, fun to work with. He was just like Bugs Bunny. He was always cracking jokes at somebody's expense, and everybody in the room knew the joke except the person that he was cracking the joke about. And it was always good natured. He wasn't mean about it or anything like that. He was a crazy guy, and he was a lot of fun. And working with him, I think, made me more than ever like Warner Brothers. A quintessential Clampett moment is Daffy's debut in Porky's Duck Hunt. Bob and Tex worked very closely on the story on that. Bob, as Tex's assistant, uh, was in charge of doing most of the layouts and was also Tex's head animator. Tex Avery said to Bob, just have Daffy exit funny in some funny way. And Bob says, can I do anything I want? And Tex says, sure. <laughs> Don't let it worry you, Skipper. I'm just a crazy darn fool duck. <laughs> He 
was Daffy Duck just go crazy and bounce up and down in his head and, and whoop and holler. And that was a, a, a level of wackiness that few moviegoers had ever seen in the late 30s. <laughs> that kind of looniness was startling, I'm sure. And that's when Bob Clampett was promoted into the director chair. The other three units, they were making the Merry Melodies. The Merry Melodies were the cartoons being made in color, and they were considered the prestige cartoons. And Grandmother, what a large snozzola you had. I can't hear very good. This was Leon Schlesinger's attempt to compete with Disney and MGM. Welcome, little girl. Now, Disney and MGM had much bigger budgets than Leon had to make cartoons with, and so it was very difficult to try to compete. Now, to amortize that cost, they had a very low-budget series called the Looney Tunes, which were all in black and white. As the studio was growing, they were adding new people. They'd put all the new people, the beginners, in the black and white unit. Now, Bob Clampett, he had to do the Looney Tunes while the other guys did the Merry Melodies. And they contributed a few Looney Tunes to fill out the schedule, but mostly they were done by Bob Clampett's unit. This is my opinion, but it's based on a lot of circumstantial evidence. I really believe that Leon put Bob in charge of that to save it because Bob Clampett had all these these great ideas. Clampett is working in the later 30s and early 40s when the Warner style is really beginning to gel. They're discarding the kind of non-entity characters like Buddy and Cookie, Foxy, who really didn't have much in the way of discernible personalities. So long, folks! And they're finding what the personalities of their characters really are. Bob initially did Porky Pig cartoons in the black and white Looney Tune era. He really helped change and make Porky Pig into the character we know him today. You heard what the, 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 the boss said. If we're a little, little late again, we lose our we'll get canned. The early Tex Avery, Frank Tashlin, Porky Pig was this big, fat pig. Bob redesigned the character to be smaller, cuter, made his head bigger, made his body smaller and that became the Porky Pig that we, we know today. We considered Bob Clampett kind of off the wall, but when I look back at his cartoons, they are great, they are classics, like Porky and Wacky Land. That just brought the house down, and to this day, I enjoy it. The cartoon Porky and Wacky Land is considered a classic. <laughs> Porky is hunting a crazy dodo bird and enters a kind of a surreal Salvador Dali-esque landscape. I don't know that the people who worked on that cartoon were students of surrealism, but this particular cartoon just went farther out than anyone had ever attempted to go before. Yes, I'm really the last of the dodos. Ain't I, fellas? Yeah, man! In 1941, Tex Avery left the Schlesinger studio to go to MGM. So at this point, Bob Clampett is given Tex Avery's unit. He now has the a Mary Melody's unit. Wow! And from the Hepcat on, the Clampett cartoons continue to get even more wild because Bob keeps experimenting with different techniques and keeps building on what he's learning. Clampett was so popular in the theaters that Leon Schlesinger told the other guys, you gotta be like Clampett. More gags, more action, you know, make people love these characters. Come out of there, you rat! Come on out! <laughs> Other directors have certain traits that you can pick out, like Chuck Jones is all about style. Uh, Tex Avery, people talk about his timing and his exaggeration. With Clampett, what's different about him is that he did everything that the other directors did all at one time. Like Tex Avery, he knew he was making films and they were cartoons, and in cartoons you can do anything. His characters are the word that keep coming to mind are things like flexible and plastic, <laughs> because even though by the early 40s the characters are becoming more solid in their anatomy and more certain in their structure, clampets are still rubberier and there's a physicality 
to his animation that I think carries through into some of the wilder moments in other films done by other directors while he was there or even after he left. The characters are placed in crazy situations. Their reactions are completely wild. The word that really comes to mind is energy. Energy is the, is the thing above all that separates his cartoons and a kind of comic anarchy in that energetic presentation oh, yeah! that was unique to him in his cartoon. To me, Clampett is the one that invented acting in cartoons. It wasn't done before him. Oh, the little man from the draft board is coming to see me. Oh, the, 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 the man from the draft board! Oh, yeah! Clampett's characters act like humans. They're very exaggerated. Yes, me. It has to be me. Poor me. But it's never just generic happy, it's never just generic sad. It's always a very specific expression. So you watch Daffy Duck in his cartoons. He doesn't have a model sheet of Daffy's three expressions. Nowadays, when you make a cartoon, here's Homer's happy expression, here's his sad expression, here's his dumbfounded expression. And that's it, never varies. Humans aren't like that though. Each human has a range of expressions, a lot bigger than three or four expressions. Watch the Clampett characters. When they go from one expression to another, on the way from one expression to another, they have strange faces and, and things that move from one to the next. And that's the way real people are. It's something about the thought process is changing from one mood to the next. And you see that all over the Clampett cartoons, especially in the Rod Scribner scenes and the Manny Gold scenes. Freeze frame them and they, they don't smoothly go from one pose into the next one. They're not in between. Things happen along the way that enrich what's going on. And that's not a thing that I think that the audience can see, but you can feel it. The individual drawings that you don't see, because they only last 1 24th of a second, they are fantastic. Five seconds of it, and you'll see more expressions than in your 10 years of the rest of Warner Brothers cartoons. It's unbelievable. Dad, in particular, liked to look at what was happening out in the world. He was a very hip guy, and whatever was fashionable or a fad at the time, and bring that to his cartoon. I know I got a rep for being kind of hip about the latest step when we're dancing. And it's clear, no matter who you look at, everyone is trying to bring in references from film and comics and novels and popular music. But Clampett really does a great job, especially in book review, where he can draw on all of these images uh, the performers, Tommy Dorsey and Frank Sinatra and Danny Kaye and Little Red Riding Hood and various magazine titles that are popular at the time, but also the songs. His cartoons are just overflowing with music, and that's one way that he really brings in a lot of contemporary references. And a lot of animators have one influence. It's Disney. Clapper was influenced by everything, film, radio, music, jazz, and he was particularly influenced by strong, exaggerated performers. Hey, Batman, look, stilts! He loved Al Jolson, because Al Jolson was the world's greatest entertainer at the time, you know, in the late 20s and the early 30s. The guy gave his all when he went on stage. That's how clamp it was. He felt it was his duty when he made a film to give everything to the audience. Every frame was valuable. Get me out! Yeah. I love um, Great Piggy Bank Robbery from Bob Clampett for its just sheer manic depravity <laughs> of Daffy's fandom over these Dick Tracy-style characters. Great Piggy Bank Robbery was basically a cartoon with one character all the way through it, and yet it's completely gripping. But from the first scene, when Daffy Duck is just marching back and forth in front of the mailbox to um, Raymond Scott's powerhouse... I was just completely gripped. This was something I had never seen before. I just had this, this feeling of weirdness that was going on. Daffy was drawn so crazy, and he had this really urgent walk, and the poses. This was animated by Izzy Ellis. He had this real angular style that most people associate with UPA or even later Chuck Jones. Here it is in 1945 or whenever that cartoon was made. The scene where Daffy Duck is on the phone. speaking. There's no background. It's just Daffy Duck saying, my piggy bank's been stolen. Oh, agony, agony. There's a cut in the middle of it where it switches animators. Hey, Cody! What do I do? It goes to Rod Scribner. I freeze frame that thing a million times. I show it to all my animators. Every single drawing is completely different. It doesn't even look like it animates. When you look at it in freeze frame, 
It looks like it's just a bunch of unrelated drawings. It's the most amazing scene ever in animation. Yet it's completely smooth when you watch it in real time. And there's a million ideas. Yet it's the best acting. It totally tells you what Daffy Duck is feeling at that time. What's the matter with me? I'm Duck Twayfee! I've often thought, okay, there's Bob Clampett, the young animator, sitting at his table one day and he's trying to figure out how to make something move just a little bit better, just a little bit funnier, just a little bit more energy. And, and I just see him thinking, why don't I just do a big blob for a few frames? Why don't I just make the eyeball like this long? I thought, where did that come from? Where did he think of that? I can't imagine that there was a handbook on how to do something wacky. These guys were making it up as they went along, and that's one of the, one of the great charms of it. You say your piggy bank's stolen? Huh, that's small stuff. <laughs> Many cartoons use the characters to fulfill the story point. You know, I've got to get them from here to here so that I can make this point and get to this gag. It never feels like that in the Clamper cartoon. It may be sometimes what's happening, but usually the gags come out of the character. <laughs> Chuck Jones, to me, is the opposite of that. He's a very good director, but his, di his directing is in front of the characters. His characters are victims of the direction. When something happens to Daffy Duck in those Bugs and Daffy cartoons like Rabbit Seasoning, it's really not fair to Daffy. I feel sorry for him. You know, Bugs Bunny is not winning those cartoons on his own. Daffy Duck has no choice but to lose. It's preordained that he's going to lose this cartoon for no reason. I never feel that from a Clamper cartoon. You never know which way it's going to go. It's all up to the characters. I'm gonna rub you out, see? Rub you out. Fantastic. And furthermore, it's unbelievable. No. They don't feel like they're being pushed around by the director. And that's a really rare thing. I mean, his characters just seem alive. He really didn't play by all the rules. There are Bugs Bunny cartoons where Bugs Bunny is the fall guy, the guy getting you know, the treatment usually reserved for Elmer Fudd. Falling Hair, brilliant cartoon. Because in the beginning, when you first see Bugs Bunny, he's in complete control. He's the calmest, coolest character ever. He's sitting on the wing of the plane, and he's reading the book about gremlins. Gremlin, <laughs> what a fairy tale. <laughs> and then when he finds out that the gremlin wins against him, he starts to lose control. Because <laughs> he's so frustrated. You know, he's just, he's not used to losing. So when he does, he's gonna lose big. And it's a great cartoon. He did the same thing in Tortoise Wins by Hair. Time's a wasting, Speedy. Why, that little, mm, I'm a boo, I'll show him. <laughs> the scene where Bugs Bunny kicks over the projector. I can't understand it. It's against the laws of nature. And then he's complaining about the title beating me, a rabbit. How does that moron do it? You know, some critics say that, well, Bugs Bunny has to always win. Well, nobody always wins in real life. Why does he always have to win? I think that's crazy. Clampett's Bugs is much wilder and much screwier than Chuck Jones's Bugs, who's much more refined, genteel sort of rabbit. He'll do more devious things than I think other people's Bugs would, is when he invades uh, Elmer's dream to get him to re-sign with Warners. The rabbits are coming, hooray, hooray. The rabbits are coming, hooray. Dressing Elmer up in a wig and long green gown and high-heeled shoes is not something that Chuck Jones or Frizz Freeling or even Tex Avery would have done to Elmer. But in Clampett's particular universe, where pretty much anything can happen, it fits. <laughs> Finally, in 1945, Bob decided to leave the studio because television was opening up and he wanted to have more complete control and ownership over his product and he thought his chances in television would be better. And I, as a Clampett fan, am so sorry that Clampett chose to end his career in theatrical cartoons when he did. Heaven only knows what we might have seen if Bob had stayed at Warner's. His influence was felt throughout the studio. His development of Porky Pig in the 30s, his completely crazy, funny, wild, off-the-wall style in the 40s, a style which helped define Bugs Bunny. It gave us Tweety. You know, I thought I taught a pretty tan. The wild woo hoo 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 Daffy Duck, that's a uh, Bob Clampett creation. I love that duck. Clampett was the first guy to really make those characters come alive. <laughs> 
His cartoons are not as well known as some of the other director's cartoons because he left Warner's in the mid 40s. And then for several decades, it was only the post 48 Warner cartoons that were continually shown on TV. So I'm really glad that people are becoming aware of Bob Clampett's work. Well, now I've seen everything. <laughs> Rock, the rock, the rock, and so and so and so forth.